Welcome to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, where we are going to dissect the first half of the first day of testimony from a class action that Musk was defending in July of 2021 regarding the Solar City bailout from November of 2016 brought against Musk by his own shareholders immediately following the transaction close. As we go through the thousands of pages of testimony, we are going to show you the actual pages from the transcripts and include a link to Plainsight.org who has been able to make these documents available for us to use. Articles will include the author and date whenever possible in the clipping, and some quotes will be taken from Ashley Vance's long-winded biography title called Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future. Those quotes will be labeled simply as Ashley Vance. And although we do not have access to the actual exhibits, whenever possible we will try to find publicly available materials that convey the same or similar information with the understanding that they may differ a little from the exhibits presented to the court. As a small preamble here, we're going to remind viewers of a very basic tenet of common law, and that is falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. It is a Latin phrase translated as false in one thing, false in all things. This tenet allows a court to completely disregard testimony of any witness if they are caught giving false testimony. So all the plaintiffs in this case have to do to have Musk's accounts removed from consideration is to catch him in a single falsehood. Also, this court has determined previously that the burden of proof upon the plaintiffs is not beyond all reasonable doubt. A memorandum written in February of 2020 declared that they need only demonstrate that Musk had coercive influence ability with regards to the Solar City bailout. The plaintiffs don't even need to prove that he used it, only that he had the ability to use it. So if the plaintiffs win this case, what is it going to cost Musk? Well, let's start by saying that Musk had the ability to settle this out of court. All of the other defendants, mostly other Tesla board members, did exactly that. They were assigned fines by the court totaling $60 million that were paid through insurance policies. They pretty much got off scot-free. Musk did not do that. Instead, he dug in his heels to fight this in court for the past four years and change, and now he is personally on the hook for the entire deal. The relief sought by the plaintiffs reads as follows. To repay the cost of the $2.6 billion deal, and to disgorge the profits on his Solar City stock. When Musk loses this case, if the plaintiffs are awarded every relief they're asking for, Musk will have to pay back from his own pocket the entire purchase price of this deal and hand over the profits from his 16.5 million shares of Tesla he received at the time of the transaction, currently worth around $11.5 billion at $700 per share, making this the largest judgment against an individual in US legal history. The plaintiffs in this case, by the way, are not simple single shareholders. The co-lead plaintiffs in this class action at the time of consolidation in 2017 included the Arkansas Teacher Retirement System, the Boston Legal Retirement System, Roofers Local 149 Pension Fund, Oklahoma Firefighters Pension and Retirement System, KBC Asset Management NV located in Belgium, Ernst Spar Invest Capital and Lage Gesellschaft MBH from Austria, and Stichting Blue Sky Active Large Cap Equity USA Fund from the Netherlands with Aaron Rock named as the only individual amongst the co-lead plaintiffs at the time. That list has since expanded. And with those details out of the way, let's start dissecting Class Action 12711 VCS in the Delaware Court of Chancery, Vice Chancellor Joseph R. Sleitz III presiding, who starts on page four by reminding parties to keep to their schedules and decorum. The lawyers for both sides are introduced to the courts, so here are the faces to go with those names. Christine McIntosh introduces the legal team for the plaintiff's side, starting with Dan Berger, Kelly Tucker, and Vivek Hubadaya from Grant and Eisenhofer. Representing the Oklahoma Firefighters Pension and Retirement Fund is Chase Rankin. Randall Barron and Max Huffman are there from Robbins Geller. Lee Rudy, Eric Zagar, Justin Relaford, and Matt Benedict are there from Kessler Topaz. From Prickett Jones and Elliott are Kevin Davenport and Sam Klosik, and their hot seat tech support is Michael Torres. Representing Musk is Garrett Moritz from Ross Ehrenstam, as well as Evan Chesler, Daniel Slifkin, Vanessa Lavely, and Helam Gebermeriam from Kravath. For the nominal defendant Tesla Inc. is Nick Mosal from Potter Anderson and Karun, Bill Berry, who is Tesla's VP of litigation, and Candace Jackman, who is Tesla's general counsel after the latest round of departures from the Tesla legal team. This is the first time we've heard her name. On page 7, the direct examination of Elon Musk begins, with Chesler asking him questions meant to introduce Musk to the court. These are mainly fluff questions, such as, where were you born, what's your backstory, remind us what a rough childhood you had, 
It's basically Musk reciting his autobiography with many of the same errors, contradictions, and omissions of truth that we've seen him make before. For example, on page 8, Musk tells the court he went to the University of Pennsylvania on what he called a big scholarship. Yet Musk also claims in news articles that he racked up six figures worth of student debt, so on one of those two points he appears to be confused. On page 9, Musk tells the court he decided to do grad studies at Stanford in material science and physics, but fails to disclose at this time that he never actually attended the school. Also, Musk graduated Penn with a Bachelor's of Science in Economics and a Bachelor of Arts in Physics. Musk does not even have a master's degree in either, just basic bachelor diplomas, and he does not have a PhD in any discipline. He claims he was offered some well-paying jobs on Wall Street that he refused, yet when Musk started up X.com with Harris Fricker and two other partners, it was Fricker and the partner he brought with him who knew the industry, and Musk had to resort to reading books to keep up with them. So it would be interesting to see who offered Musk what job and at what pay level, since he didn't mention anybody. On page 11, Musk claimed to be a software writer, but we know from his coding at Zip2 that he was not a professional coder, and everything that he wrote had to be rewritten by actual professionals. Musk mentions founding Zip2 without any acknowledgement of his brother Kimball or of Greg Curry, claiming he wrote the entire website himself. Without Greg Curry's involvement and connections, Zip2 would never have launched. Musk does also not mention Rich Sorkin, who was brought in by Curry as CEO. Musk is pretending that the company was his, but he was just the CTO, and so poor at his job that other software engineers had to be brought aboard to rewrite his code from scratch. On page 15, Musk claims to have personally started X.com, again without mentioning that there were three other co-founders. They were Harris Fricker, Edward Ho, and Christopher Payne, who apparently still has no pictures online. Then Musk's version of the ConfinityX.com merger is relayed, with all the same inaccuracies that we've heard before. X.com and Confinity were not equals in this space, despite Musk's claim to the contrary. X.com was, as one software engineer that worked there put it, a Hollywood set of a website that barely fooled oblivious investors like Mike Moritz of Sequoia Capital. Musk claims that the new company was called PayPal, which it eventually was, but it was after Musk was fired as CEO. He claims to have taken the company public, which he most certainly did not. That distinction belongs to Peter Thiel, one of the original founders of Confinity, who replaced Musk as CEO. So the timeline here, Musk was fired as CEO in September of 2000, and formally separated from the company in March of 2001, according to this legal separation agreement found on corporate.finelaw.com. PayPal went public a year later, on February 15, 2002, and was sold to eBay on July 8th of 2002, long after Musk's involvement with the company as anything but a shareholder. So when he says, we took the company public, that's an outright lie. Now it's his version of the Tesla saga, and the fiction in this story is quite laughable. In his version of the story, Musk approached AC Propulsion to commercially produce the T0 EV. By making this statement, he is assuming the identity of Martin Eberhardt, who did actually work with that team as described in our Debunking Musk episode part 2. Musk drones on in this storytelling for several pages, ending on page 21. Then Musk lies under oath, claiming to have personally created Tesla. Elon Musk did not create Tesla. Martin Eberhardt and Mark Tarpenning founded the company, and they brought in Ian Wright to develop the Roadster long before Musk came aboard as an investor. The two actual founders funded this startup auto company with money they made selling their e-reader rocket book company, Nouveau Media, to TV Guide. This is another Musk lie that the plaintiff's lawyers needed to pick up on. The lawyer then has Musk read off some passages from the Tesla master plan that Musk claims to have written all by himself in 2006. Here's the problem with that entire document. At the time, Martin Eberhardt was still the CEO of Tesla, and he was getting the attention that Musk thought should be directed his way, and that caused some tremendous animosity. While Eberhardt was developing the Roadster, Musk kept insisting on changes which turned out to be incredibly expensive and time-consuming. One of the biggest things that Musk insisted on was making the vehicle out of carbon fiber, which was incredibly expensive in comparison. This input affected the manufacturing cost and release date of the car. So when Musk finally had enough of being ignored by the media, he orchestrated the ouster of Eberhardt as CEO, blaming Eberhardt for the cost overruns and delays in production. The new CEO, Michael Marks, was handpicked by Musk in the August of 2007, and he moved Eberhardt off the board of directors to the advisory board while continuing to work on R&D. But that wasn't good enough for Musk, so Musk handpicked another CEO named Ziev Drory in December of 2007 who had Eberhardt completely removed from the very company he founded. 
Then in October of 2008, Musk fired that CEO as well and took his job. Five pages later on page 26, after Musk tells the court about his vision and leadership, the lawyer asks him, why did you want Tesla to acquire SolarCity in 2016? This was a question better suited to the plaintiff's attorneys because it demonstrates Musk's bias. The question isn't, why did the company want to buy a solar installation company? What he asked was, why did you want Tesla to buy SolarCity? And this is where the pre-scripted answers really start coming out. Musk claims that Tesla is the leader in battery technology, which is an untrue statement. Tesla gets the majority of their batteries from Panasonic, and many articles cast doubt on any advantage that Tesla has in this space. Even the Gigafactory that bears Tesla's name in Nevada is actually staffed and operated by Panasonic to produce those power cells. The lawyer asks him directly if Musk wanted to pursue the acquisition of SolarCity to bail out his investment in the company. Musk answers no, then immediately tells a story about how his net worth really didn't change at all, despite receiving 22% or about $600 million in stock for selling a company that has since been determined to be insolvent at the time it was acquired. On pages 27 and 28, Musk tells the court that SolarCity was viable in its own right because the share price gave the company a multi-billion dollar valuation. But we know for certain because of the fallout that this stock price did not reflect the financial health of the company, which was also $3.4 billion in debt. And Lyndon Rive, Musk's cousin and CEO of the company, testified in his deposition on this case that he personally informed Musk in 2015 that the company would need about $300 million just to stay afloat. So Musk's insistence that he thought the company was in good financial health is false testimony that his own cousin contradicts. Further, an assessment done by Ernst & Young immediately after the acquisition indicated that the company was indeed insolvent and unable to meet its financial obligations. Time for Musk to talk about the directors at Tesla and Musk's relationship with them. When asked about his relationship with his directors, he described it as good, then immediately says, I'm not sure. He describes him as competent, yet his brother Kimball sits on the board and he has absolutely no knowledge of the automobile industry, the battery industry, the energy sector, or any other related topic. These next questions starting from page 28 are going to be read verbatim. Question, did you control what your directors did and what they decided to do? Answer, definitely not. But take a quick note here. This question is extremely vague, not mentioning the acquisition, the voting process, or the investigative or negotiating processes in question with regards to this bailout. Next question, did you control the activities of any of the committees on the board of Tesla? And the answer, I was not even on the committees. I don't even know what happened during those committees. Again, take note, if you're paying attention, you'll see that Musk did not answer that question. Question, did you control the compensation of the directors? The answer, no. However, most of the members on this board sit on other boards of other Musk companies, so we'll be discussing that later. Question, did you control the election to or removal from the board of any of the directors? Answer, in bringing on a new director, we would seek unanimous approval of any new director added, so anyone could object and we would not add someone. We've never actively removed anyone from the board. People have dropped off after three terms, but we have not fired anybody really. So the take home here, it's apparently a unanimous process, which means that Musk absolutely has control over who joins. Just because others also have that power of veto, doesn't mean that his veto counts any less. If Musk doesn't want somebody on the board, they can't join. Next question. Mr. Musk, did you ever say or suggest in any way that you would somehow retaliate against a director who did not vote in favor of the Solar City transaction? The answer is no. Question, did you vote on any offer that was made by Tesla for Solar City? And the answer is, I did not. Question, did you participate in the board's evaluation of the economic terms of the deal? The answer, no. However, you're going to see shortly that this is untrue. Question, did you participate in the board's negotiation of the economic terms of the deal? The answer is no. Next question is kind of important. Were you informed from time to time by the investment bankers of the progress of the negotiation? And the answer here is not no. The answer here is yes. Now remember, Musk is in a complete conflict of interest position here because he is chairman of the board of both companies. So he must recuse himself from any and all aspects of this transaction. When someone actually recuses themselves to avoid conflict, they are to abandon all aspects of the process and allow the two parties to dictate the arrangement between themselves. Musk did not do this. So before the plaintiff's lawyers have any shot at Musk, he has already admitted to the conflict of interest here. 
On page 30, Musk tells the court he was in direct contact with the investment bankers with regards to the progress in negotiations, including with Robin Denholm, whom Musk had handpicked to replace him as chairperson after the SEC fired him from that position for his fraudulent 420 tweet when they fined him $40 million. And at this point, Musk throws Denholm under the bus, telling the court that she set the terms, she set the price, she did the negotiations, and she finalized the deal. Now, generally speaking, we are not reading ahead in these proceedings. We're sharing what we know as we go through the material as it's discovered. We will, however, say this, based on what we've seen in social media and in Denholm's testimony. If Robin Denholm was in charge of these negotiations, setting the price and finalizing the deal, this was apparently news to Robin Denholm, who doesn't seem to recall much of what happened with this multi-billion dollar acquisition. As a side note, Robin Denholm was named as a defendant in this action, as were the other directors of Tesla at the time that the deal was struck, and none of them wanted to defend their actions in this matter, so they settled out of court and they paid fines totaling $60 million in return for immunity from further prosecution on this action. Moving on, the lawyer asked Musk if Musk believes he controls the stockholders of Tesla. This is a yes-no answer, and it's talked around, but it goes unanswered. Then Musk is asked, did you have any interactions with stockholders before they were to vote on the Tesla and SolarCity transaction? Again, a yes-no question that goes unanswered except for some rambling, but in that rambling, he admits to telling them, we need to acquire SolarCity so we can do integrated solar battery power. That is not recusing himself from discussions. As for interacting with shareholders, Musk unveiled a brand new Solar City product to a cheering crowd on the set of Desperate Housewives in the fall of 2016. Musk stood in front of this crowd and held up a solar roofing tile that was supposedly going to revolutionize the entire industry. This presentation was on October 31st of 2016. The shareholders vote was held 17 days later on November 17th of 2016. That is interacting with the shareholders before they were going to vote. And what's worse, the entire presentation was a lie. The tile that Musk showed them did not work, and there's no spinning that. Musk committed fraud at this event to sway the votes of the shareholders to approve the acquisition. Prior to this, Musk also went on a publicity tour for this acquisition that summer, telling everyone who would listen that this deal was a no-brainer way back in June of 2016. Every single article that was printed with Musk saying it's a no-brainer is Musk interacting with the shareholders and failing to recuse himself. Halfway down page 32, the question of bridge financing came up. Musk wanted Tesla to finance Solar City because it was floundering. You typically don't need to provide bridge financing for companies that are in good financial health. As defined by Investopedia, bridge financing helps bridge the gap in a company's finances from the time its money is set to run out to when it is expected to receive an infusion of funds later on. If your money isn't going to run out, you don't need a bridge loan. However, Musk needed to do something because SolarCity was not able to conduct additional funding rounds. Musk instead created another round of solar bonds and we covered those in detail in our other episodes on this topic. Long story short, Musk created these solar bonds that promised a 6.5% annual rate of return that was redeemable in 18 months. Then he bought a significant chunk of them himself using his shares in Tesla as collateral for the loan he took out to buy them. Then he bought another quarter billion dollars worth of bonds through SpaceX using money they had just received from NASA for Crew Dragon. And his cousins at Solar City also bought a bunch of them up. Now if Solar City had floundered at this point, all of those bonds would have been absolutely worthless. And the kicker here, by the time these bonds came due, it was Tesla that would have had to pay them out, not Solar City. Even though Tesla tried really hard to avoid paying them, by looking for loopholes. Questioning turns to the Model 3 rollout of 2017 and the difficulty that the company was having with that production line. Musk tells a story about the hundreds of car startups that failed over the years, naming DeLorean, which was produced from 1981 to 1983, and Tucker, which produced cars for a single year back in 1948. Musk claims on page 35 that Tesla was the first company to succeed in achieving volume production of any car. Certainly that's news to Honda, Toyota, Audi, Volkswagen, and every other car manufacturer in the world who make more cars than Tesla does today. Musk is then asked about why he gutted Solar City of personnel to fix the problems in the Model 3 line, where Musk actually admits to putting Solar City lawyers to work on the assembly lines for the Model 3, and that was in outdoor tents. Vice Chancellor Slight speaks for the first time since the direct examination started, and he tells Musk, that's a little scary. Musk tells the court directly that when he says, all hands on deck, it means all hands on deck. This is a statement that needed to be noted by the plaintiff's lawyers as well. 
This shows Musk's unilateral authority over the entire operation and his heavy-handed practices with regards to his employees. What experience would accountants and lawyers have in assembling these cars? It shows, using Musk's own words, that what he says is not to be questioned and must be obeyed. And yes, that is a little scary, as the Vice Chancellor said. The lawyer swaps topics immediately to the changes that Musk made in the Solar City business model. The door-to-door -door sales model that Tesla bought was scrapped. The advertising model that Tesla bought was scrapped. And although it isn't mentioned here, the deal that Solar City worked out with Home Depot was terminated, all in favor of an online model that would not bear fruit. Page 37, line 20, Musk claims that Tesla now has the lowest cost of solar in the United States. Which is odd because just recently Tesla reneged on a bunch of signed contracts trying to increase their costs for solar installations. Which is the basis for another class action that Musk will have to face in the months and years to come, and it casts serious doubts on Musk's claim. Casting further doubt on this claim is this ranking of the top 25 solar panel manufacturers as found on letsgosolar.com, where Tesla is not mentioned at all, and that page is copyright 2021. On page 39, the lawyer asks Musk about the solar roof tile, and Musk is forced to admit, on the record, that at the time of the acquisition, there was no volume production solar roof product in existence. Now that information was never disclosed to the shareholders before their vote, because this was what Musk was telling them at the time. Like the interesting thing is that the houses you see around you are all solar houses. I don't know if you know that. If you're hearing shades of Elizabeth Holmes' Theranos in these false claims, you're not alone. What's worse, the company had been taking $1,000 deposits for this product, which Tesla was going to have to eventually pay back in June of 2020. Musk claims to have installed version 0.9 on his own house as a trial run in 2017, but as he already told the court, there was no such product. So what got installed? Musk's lawyer's questioning comes to a close with a couple of softball questions. One about the valuation of Tesla at the time of acquisition versus now, which of course is extremely different, but it's not based on performance or reality with all the products yet to be delivered way past their expected due dates. And then with his final answer, Musk lies again. The lawyer asks him on page 43 what significance the acquisition of SolarCity had for achieving the goals of Musk's master plan. Musk tells the court it provided the third pillar for the company, providing the sustainable energy generation. Except, as Musk already testified, that is not what happened. Solar City came into the Tesla fold, got gutted, became a shadow of its former self, and Musk put the Solar City personnel to work on his Model 3 assembly line in tents in his parking lot. And on that note, Chesler signs off, with Mr. Randall Barron for the plaintiff stepping up for the first cross-examination of Musk. That starts on page 44. And this guy has been waiting for years to get this guy in that chair. Barron warns Musk straight off the bat that there is a lot of material to cover, three notebooks worth, so being able to move through the questions quickly will be to everyone's benefit. The first question from Barron clarifies that Musk was indeed chairman of the board of both companies at the time of the bailout, and that kind of sets the tone. It's pretty obvious that Barron has been looking forward to having Musk answer his questions on the stand, but he starts by showing three video clips of Musk's deposition from two years ago, labeled JX2789. We don't have those clips, but we can read off the audio verbatim. It's Musk on tape being rude and adversarial towards Mr. Barron, telling him, but we'll get back to it and that's why I suggest you just stop wasting everyone's time and see how the next few quarters go, at least the balance of the year. And then if that still doesn't work out, then I suggest you come back and start wasting everyone's time again. Another clip from the same videotape, again this is Musk. So what you will see as we solve these things as, because resources have now been reapplied to solar, is a dramatic increase in the deployment of megawatts in the years to come. At least, one cannot predict these things precisely, but in the years to come, this case will look silly and you will have wasted your time and ours. In the third clip, again this is Musk, it was like, remind me that there was some filed suit against us for this 5,000 a week Model 3 thing, and then we got to 5,000 a week, and this is obviously a waste of time. It's the same thing. We will fix the solar situation and you'll see it's just a big waste of time. These three clips demonstrate to the court and on the record the dismissive attitude that this lawyer has had to put up with from Musk since the beginning of this action. Barron then starts questioning Musk about these false predictions he made in 2019 during his deposition by asking yes-no questions that Musk responds to with vague references to promises versus aspirations. For example, Barron reminds Musk that his sworn deposition claimed that Tesla would have fixed the solar issues by the end of the year, and Musk answers, that was my aspiration. 
Musk tries to tell the court that the solar business has been fixed, but Barron pulls up exhibit PDX1 on the screen, which would have been a graph similar to this one published on Seeking Alpha. The graph shows the decline of SolarCity's installation numbers, and we have marked post on this graph when the bailout occurred and when Musk was deposed wherein he made these statements. And straight away, the plaintiff's lawyers prove to the court this is not a waste of anybody's time, despite Musk's claim to the contrary, because none of these problems have been solved. All of these numbers are taken directly from the Tesla quarterly reports, and since the acquisition, they have tanked. Both men are looking at the same materials. Musk sees an amazing growth rate, as he states on page 53. Barron sees a faltering company. You can make up your own mind who is correct. On page 50, Barron mentions the two financial forecasts that were provided to shareholders as part of the bailout proxy. One of them forecasts that SolarCity would be installing 710 megawatts of solar panels per quarter immediately following the bailout, and the other was more conservative at 523 megawatts per quarter. On this graph, those predictions would have been way up here. Actual solar panel installs for Tesla Energy present day from the second quarter of 2021 are stuck at 92 megawatts, which is 13% of the higher projection that shareholders used to make their decision when voting for this bailout. In light of this evidence, Musk wants to give a long-winded explanation, but Barron tells him, if you want to alliterate every time, we're here for days. Unlike the defendant's lawyers, Barron is not interested in anything but direct answers to his questions. Here is where Musk starts to become combative with the plaintiff's attorney. He calls the questions being asked somewhat really tricky and deceptive. The questions aren't, but the answers are trying to be, when all Musk has to do is reply yes or no. After letting Musk drone on for about two pages, Barron tells Musk that despite his previous diatribe, the graph indicates a faltering company. Barron notes that the decline of Solar City installations began in the fourth quarter of 2015, long before Musk can shuffle the blame off to permit offices being closed due to COVID and Model 3 launch issues as he has already tried to do. So Musk introduces a new boogeyman. It must have been changes to the tax credit structure that were responsible for the decline, without citation or evidence, of course. Then in 2020, that changes to the pandemic, which Musk didn't believe in, by the way. Not only is this well documented, it didn't stop Musk from reopening his Fremont plant against county health orders. There's some banter back and forth about the timing of redeployment of resources from Solar City to Tesla and back, before Barron reminds Musk of his testimony at the time. Then in 2019, Musk claimed Tesla had redeployed former Solar City resources and manpower back into Tesla Energy, which should have meant installation numbers for Solar City should have started climbing back to where they were, but that did not happen. The graph clearly indicates that Solar City production is a fraction of what the company enjoyed at its peak prior to the bailout, and nowhere near what Musk promised it would deliver. At the top of page 60, Barron wonders why none of these redeployments were filed with Tesla's SEC paperwork. Musk claims they were, but Barron informs him that no such paperwork exists where Musk reported in the company documents that SolarCity was declining because he had gutted the company, and Musk is unable to provide documents contradicting that fact. Barron turns the line of questioning to the pandemic and the effect it would have had on the solar industry as a whole. Musk says the entire industry got hit to different degrees, so Barron pulls up exhibit JX3193, which contradicts Musk in a big way. It's an industry analysis from Wood McKenzie, which is a global research and consultancy firm that covers the solar industry, who Musk claims not to recognize the name of, despite being the chairman of a solar installation company, and Woodmac has covered that industry for the past five decades. Their report that we don't have contains a graph similar to this one, showing that before the company was sold, Solar City enjoyed holding 33% of the market share for solar installation. But in 2019, that share had dropped to just 5%. And that is pre-COVID, so that particular argument holds no water. All of this seems to be news to Musk, although he was chairman of the board at Solar City and he's CEO at Tesla. He also states that right now, Tesla Energy is doing quote unquote, reasonably well. Exhibit JX3192 is the Tesla report for the second quarter of 2021 where that particular department claims to have lost $101 million in the previous three months. Barron identifies the growth margin during that time was negative 20%, meaning that not only was the company selling less, they were actually losing money on every sale. So Barron asked Musk for confirmation. That had nothing to do with the pandemic, correct? But the last words out of Musk's mouth before the court goes into recess were, no, it has everything to do with the pandemic trying to blame all of Tesla Energy's current woes on the COVID pandemic that he didn't even believe in. 
So in light of that statement from Musk, we're just going to leave this right here. It's a Wood McKenzie report stating that 2020 was a record year for solar installations, the best year ever, which kind of ends that line of excuses from Musk. And with that, the court took a short break at 1045. We're in recess.